I got this reputation as Mr. Mackinac Bridge. And after a while, um, people started requesting reprints of articles that I had written from 20 years before. And as I neared retirement, I, I, I wrote a book about how the bridge was built. And that's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's information out there that I took from the state of Michigan, and I had some interviews with people, and it, it wasn't a difficult book to write. But the subject that I'm going to cover tonight is the, all, all the things that have happened on the bridge since it's been up. And that is what I found fascinated people. That's what people wanted to see again and again. And I had an editor that used to come in uh, 4.30 in the afternoon, you know, just about time to close up the paper. And uh, he'd wander in and see me sitting there, and he'd say, what, uh, what's happening on the bridge today, Mike? And I can see the bridge out the front window of my house. So I would say, I didn't notice anything this morning. I mean, it looked like traffic was normal to me, you know. And he'd say, well, you better find something, because we've got room on page one, you know. <laughs> and I'd have to come up with some story about something that happened. And unfortunately, I had enough contacts that people had given me things that I kind of had a backlog, and I'd keep those. And then I would think, well, maybe today's the day to tell this story, you know, to tell that story. And when it really came time for retri retirement, people just kept bugging me and saying, you know, you got to do it. You got to write this book. Just put all that stuff in a book. You must have pictures. Well, I had 180 pictures that I used in the Mackinac Bridge book as to how it was built, but there was very little text. You know, it was just basically, you know, the, uh, the backstay span is put into place uh, as the, as the uh, unit is lifted from a barge. I mean, how many times can you say that, right? I wrote 21 chapters for the Mackinac Bridge book over three years, and I gathered about 300 photographs. And it really became a monumental work. And I was so pleased and so proud when it was named a notable book in the state of Michigan. So I think that worked out pretty good for me. So here I am tonight to tell you about it. And I like to find out a little bit about what people in my audience know about the bridge before I start, because I never know what I'm going to get. It can be very different in, in uh, Grand Rapids than it is in Iron Mountain. You know, I mean, people just have different varying degrees. So let's start with this. Raise your hand, please, if you've never crossed the Mackinac Bridge. <laughs> Two, three. Okay, three. And that's unusual because there's usually only one. I don't know why. It just works out that way, but there's usually only one. I spoke at the Grand Rapids Public Library. They told me they had 278 people in that room, and nobody raised their hand. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. And I said, seriously, nobody has in this room, everybody in this room has crossed the bridge. And everybody just looked at me, so I thought, well, I better keep going. <laughs> and I looked down, and I started into the next thing, and there was a woman in the back of the room pacing back and forth, and she was holding a little baby, and she said, okay, he hasn't been across. <laughs> so see, there was, one, there was one person, so it just seems to work out, but today we've got three. So let me throw some numbers at you, and I want you to relate the numbers that I give you to what you know about the Mackinac Bridge. I'll give you the number. You tell me what you think it could be that would relate to the bridge, and I think you'll probably do really well on this. Three. You're incorrect. <laughs> How many years it took? It's not, that's not difficult. Three years to build the bridge, 1954 to 1957. Okay? You're, you're, you're doing great. You're doing great. Okay. Um, we've got seats for you right here. We've got two for you right up here. Come on up. Come into this house. There you go. Okay, let's do another one. Um, Five. Five miles long. Did you want to try again? Five people died building the bridge. Okay, that's, that's what it was there. Okay, so five, all right? So you're doing pretty well. We should probably toughen it up just a little bit. How about uh, 41,000? No? No? Couldn't hear that one. No, we had 30,000 yesterday, they think. Miles of cable. There it is, right there. 41,000 miles of cable in the bridge. Okay? So, see, you're doing great. Now, somebody said, give me another number. Did you want the one, a number again? Can anybody else come up with something again for three? No. 
No? Three babies have been born up there. Okay? I had to keep track of these things. That's the way my job went. I had to keep track of things like that. So if you're looking for a single seat, there is one right here that we saved, right here for you. Come right over, right over here, right there, okay? So you're doing really great on the numbers. Um, let's see. How about if we toughen it up even more? 271. 271. No. No. I clocked it. It was 271 miles from the bridge to the front door here. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So that's the kind of fun things that I keep track of and that I kept in the book. So I've been to the top of the towers three times. Um, my job as a reporter, I covered police and courts and the Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac and I covered arts, and I covered the bridge. And the bridge probably got most of my time. I used to have hair sh as short as a police officer. I didn't stand out in court at all because I had such short hair. Then I retired, and I now, as a second uh, avocation, have taken a hobby, and wow, did it take off. I now perform as Gordon Lightfoot, live in concert. <laughs> and I travel all over the Midwest, and I'm in theaters with a band, and we are in 1,500 to 2,000 seat theaters, and wow. What a, what a great time I'm having with that. So that's really been a fun thing, and Gord is great to me. So I'll come back someday and do that when I have a, a program on that here. All right, so I've been up here three times. Uh, the first two times, the weather was terrible. Uh, the last time, the weather was perfect, and the sun was shining, and the water was calm, and I could hear traffic below, and I could hear people talking on boats below. And I just thought, this is great, and I've got to get this picture. So that's the picture I took looking towards the Upper Peninsula uh, the last time that I was up there. There was a beautiful cloud bank rolling through, which is not unusual. The people weren't in the clouds. But <laughs> I had a graphic artist that did that for me later. But these are just people that contributed. They were part of the bridge's history. There were so many wonderful people that had a role in the Mackinac Bridge. So that's the book that I'm here to talk about today. The other one I did for Arcadia Publishing about how the Mackinac Bridge was built. So you remember these days? Anybody uh, come up to the Straits back in the days when you had to sit in line, you know, uh, 20 hours out on the highway? And uh, yeah, that's the way it was. And the old saying was, once you got to the dock, you only had four more hours to wait. <laughs> because that's the way it was. And we didn't know any different, and so people would just have to do that. Um, the, uh, the state of Michigan had a lot of money invested in boats and in docks and in jobs. And, you know, talk about a bridge. Nah, you know, we're not sure we really need this. And people would complain, and they would write letters. And one year, uh, the mayor of our town got a letter back saying, again, you've written to me asking why there's not a bridge, you know. And uh, geologists say it can't be done. Nothing exists bigger than the Golden Gate. This would have to be bigger than the Golden Gate. And lastly, uh, we were up there three times last year, and we drove dr straight to the boat. We didn't even have to wait in line. Well, the three dates that they were there were December the 19th, <laughs> February the 23rd, and April the 6th. You know, cause Of course, there was no line then. But during vacation season, during hunting season, during vacation times, Memorial Day, holidays, Fourth of July, Labor Day, wow, I mean, yeah, the lines backed up, and, and that's the way it was. They were ready for you in Mackinac City, though. They used to have hoses to the pumps of the gas stations that would stretch all the way to the curb because people wouldn't dare get out of line. You'd never get back in that line. And so people would just pull right up and they would just, uh, you know, even walk up if they saw they were running low. I'm gonna need fuel, uh, a, a fuel up uh, with this green Plymouth back here. Didn't everybody drive a green Plymouth back in the 50s? <laughs> Seemed like they did. But that's the way it was and we needed to get a bridge built. And geologists said, can't happen. You know, the, the bottom of the straits is limestone. There's caves and caverns under there. Uh, a bridge would just collapse it. It'd fall down. Um, bigger than the Golden Gate? Wow. I mean, once that came in in the late 30s, that was a wonder of the world. This bridge would have to be higher. It'd have to be longer. We're talking five miles across those straits. It'd have to be over deeper water. San Francisco Bay, you know, gets a lot of wind, and they get fog. 
but they don't get 10 feet of ice coming through like we do in the Straits. So how would, how would a bridge stand up to that? It just wasn't thought to be possible. And about that time, after World War II, I think a lot of mines got together and just like here in your area, you know, you had automobile plants that were building airplanes for the war. You know, people were all in. And a lot of minds got together and things that were previously thought to be impossible, all of a sudden, you know, we can do this. There might be a way we can do this. And that was the attitude that let's get it done. And so um, the Mackinac Bridge Authority was, uh, was, was formed with the idea that attempts that had failed back in the 30s because there wasn't money, materials, or men with the war coming, maybe, maybe this could happen. They were studying the whole idea, let's say. And about that time, we had a man who ran for governor of our state who wore a bow tie. And G. Menon Williams uh, was immensely popular. He won several times, several, several terms, as the governor of our state. And one of his campaign promises was, if elected, how many times have we heard those words, you know? <laughs> but if elected, I'm going to see to it we get a bridge built at the Straits of Mackinac. Well, OK. Uh, one thing he had going for him was he had a superb ally in a man from St. Ignis, a banker named Prentice M. Brown. And Prentice M. Brown was a, uh, a state senator. He, uh, he knew money, he knew people, and he knew the troubles of getting across the straits, trying to get to Lansing, to meetings. And, uh, you know, the ferry boats wouldn't run. The car ferries wouldn't run. Too much ice. He would take the train ferry, and the train ferry would get stuck in the ice. I mean, it was just a, a, a situation that he thought we can, we can do better. And he really wanted that for the Upper Peninsula, too. Well, as they talked about uh, trying to get this done, they lobbied in Lansing, and they lobbied in, 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 in everywhere they could, really. And the support seemed to be overwhelming. I mean, you know, Soapy, this, this is a great idea. Let's, we, we're on board. We want to build your bridge, you know. PM, they called Prentice M. Brown PM. PM, uh, you know, this, Good stuff, good stuff. Let's, let's, let's get your bridge going, you know. But everybody agreed on one thing. Don't ask us to pay for it. <laughs> and that was the overwhelming sentiment. And people tried to come up with different ways that might work. And, you know, I, I speak sometimes to people in different states. And I have to tell them that, you know, it's probably not that way where they live. But here in Michigan, our Democrats and Republicans don't always agree on everything, you know. <laughs> And that became a political football. And people would try to come up with plans to pay for the bridge, and it would get shot down. And then a couple years later, that party would come up with the same plan. And the other party would say, no way. And it was just back and forth. It was ridiculous. But we knew one thing, that uh, it was going to cost a lot of money. We were looking at it maybe a $100 million project as a, as a basic cost. How do you raise those kind of funds? Should, should the whole state be taxed? Should, should drivers be taxed? Should the three counties that are near the Mackinac Bridge be taxed? What would work? Somebody came up with a bright idea that, uh, well, the thing to do is just have it be paid for by tolls. Let's get a loan from the state, and then we'll pay it back with tolls. It's simple. Well, what kind of a term are you looking for, asked Mr. Brown. And uh, when he found out that they wanted this loan paid back, you know, in a r fairly reasonable period of time, like maybe 20 years, they figured out that the toll per car would be $46. <laughs> Who was going to pay that? Nobody. Nobody. So they tried another avenue, and that was to have a private bond sale. Maybe investors would do it. Well, the bond sale flopped. At that time, the Indiana Toll Road was being built. Maybe investors thought that it would be a better bet for their money, for their return on their money, to have money invested into a road that was going to be on land, that was going to go from Chicago to points east, rather than some bridge that was going to connect some place called Mackinac City to some place called the UPA. <laughs> the UPA? Eh? <laughs> Where was that? A lot of people didn't know. They just couldn't figure out how this was going to work. Well, it flopped. So they didn't think they had enough of a plan, a concrete plan. They didn't have enough of a, more than a concept. It was just a concept. And they were trying to enlist interest. And they found that the big stumbling block was that the word had gotten out that the state of Michigan 
had refused to back any bonds that were sold. So if these bonds fail, don't come to Lansing asking for your money because we're not going to pay up. Well, that seemed pretty, pretty flimsy, and nobody wanted to put money into it. They decided to move on with the project, and let's actually hire a bridge engineer, somebody that can really come up with a concrete plan so we know what it is we're selling, not just a concept, but what's the bridge going to look like? That idea was floated. They decided to bring in the top three bridge engineers in the world. They brought in Robert Amman, a New Yorker from Sweden who had built bridges in Europe. They brought in Glenn Woodruff from California. He'd built the Oakland Bay Bridge, very famous, had built a lot of big bridges. And they brought in David Steinman, Dr. David B. Steinman from Brooklyn, New York, who had built 400 bridges on five different continents. And all three of these folks came to St. Ignace to be interviewed by the Mackinac Bridge Authority. David Steinman was small in stature, barely 5'4". I never met the man, but I've heard his voice on film. He spoke with a kind of high, lilting voice. He used very direct comments and only said what needed to be said. And he was very, very forward with his words, only what was necessary. And he died three years after the bridge was finished. But I've heard him on film. One of the questions they posed during this interview was from a pretty stern-faced member of the Bridge Authority who looked at these proposals they had submitted and said, well, we see that all three of you gentlemen have stated that you'd put giant towers in our Straits of Mackinac. What would happen? if a boat loaded with iron ore smacked into one of your towers. Woodruff and Amman just looked at each other and nobody said anything. Steinman raised his hand <laughs> and said, in my case, the ship would sink with a great loss of life. <laughs> they hired him. <laughs> he got the job. And he wanted to know how this was going to be financed because he agreed to $3.5 million as his take to build this bridge. And he had a staff in New York that was ready to go to work. But, you know, how is he going to be paid? And they said, well, there's a little problem there. <laughs> we don't have any funding and we're looking for that. And uh, he said, well, why would you not sell bonds? The bond market would go for this. They said, well, we tried that. He said, where? He said, we tried it right here in the Midwest. The top investors in the Midwest all came in and nobody wanted to touch it, you know. He said, number one, your state has to back this project. Number two, why would you not take this to Wall Street and try it in New York in front of international investors? They said, wow, if the Midwest people don't want it, why would the international bond market like it? He said, smart investors will know the value of an investment like this. You know, they took it to New York and only two days before they did, the Michigan legislature agreed after the governor and Prentice M. Brown pounded on desks and shouted and, and, and cajoled people and begged people that they would invoke an indenture clause if the bonds failed where they would back it. But can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? to the governor or to somebody like Prentice M. Brown to go back to the legislators and say, uh, we aren't able to make the bond payments, so could you kind of help us out? I mean, they didn't want that ever to happen. So they had another bond meeting, and it was in New York. They held it at the Union Securities Exchange office, and they had a sizable crowd, just like the first crowd, but in terms of numbers. But they took a little break, and as they were being served coffee and rolls after Prentice M. Brown had talked about a two-tiered investment program that David Steinman came up with where you could get in for a small amount of money at one interest rate or a bigger amount of money at a better interest rate, attracting two different types of investors. And then you had David Steinman get up and talk about how the bridge was going to be built and how he was going to take care of everything, and he had the staff that was going to do it, and they were going to have it done on time and on budget, and it was going to work. And he wasn't worried about, about caverns and caves at the bottom of the straits. He had a plan. It was going to work. Ice, he didn't care. It was going to be ta taken care of. He had the wherewithal to do this sort of thing. 
And so the governor was going to come in in the second half with his political allies, and they were going to kind of close the sale, you know. Well, during the coffee break, somebody from the Union Securities Company came up and said, uh, Mr. Brown, how, how would you like to be paid? He said, well, I mean, we're, uh, we're trying to get some interest going here. We were very unsuccessful the last time we tried this in the Midwest, and we're hoping that just the fact that we have a, a concrete proposal here in front of these people and they're looking at a real prospectus might attract some investors. And down the road, if we get any interest going, why, we'll figure out how we're going to pay this, yeah, how to get this paid. He said, no, sir, we need to pay you right now. The bonds have all sold. <laughs> I think Prentice M. Brown took a couple steps backwards and said, they're all sold? And he said, yes, they are. And he said, well, how much money do you want to give me today? He said, well, we want to give you everything today. After we take our share out for the commission for conducting the bond sale, we'd like to pay you uh, $96,400,033.33 right now. And Brown said, uh, 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 <laughs> he's a banker, you know. He said, I guess a certified cashier's check would do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm only showing you about 10% of the pictures that are in this book that I'm talking about tonight, but you're going to see this one because there's that check. A certified cashier's check for $96,400,033.33 dated February the 17th of 1954. Check number 4002. They were going to get their bridge. It was going to happen. They immediately issued contracts to American Bridge, United States Steel, Prepact, a concrete company that had developed a, a new revolutionary method of forming concrete under the water. All these big corporations signed on and they had contracts and let's go. 6,000 people came to the Straits to build that bridge. The population of St. Ignace is 2,700. The population where I live in Mackinac City is 878. Can you imagine having 6,000 people in town? You know what? You could make a few extra bucks if you rented out that spare bedroom. <laughs> and if you could make sandwiches and bring them down to the sidewalk at lunchtime, somebody's going to buy them. These people need to be fed. They need to have a place to go to sleep. And there are people in the Straits that are still in the motel and the restaurant business because their grandparents started out that way and learned how to take care of people. And it's hospitality, and that's where it began, in our area right there. And so um, they had the money. By the way, Prentice M. Brown, different era, you know. He folded that check in half and put it in his vest pocket and came back to St. Ignace. <laughs> you, couldn't, you wouldn't see that today, would you? So the bridge was <clears throat> underway. And as I stated before, we're not really here to talk about the building process so much. But this picture was taken in May of 1957. So you're in the last season, the last summer, and uh, just a few more pieces to go out there. And they, we had the sidewalk superintendents on hand to oversee the construction. You know, people would come and look out uh, through the telescopes and, and uh, watch and take pictures with their cameras. And it's a great photo. Ken Tyson, who passed away just a few years ago, gave me this picture to use in the book. And, and uh, it's a great photo because it's a picture of people taking pictures. It's a picture of looking at people who are looking at something. You know, you don't see a single face in the photograph. But Ken had this uh, picture up in a frame right above the cash register in his gift shop of his restaurant. And people would come up to pay their bill, and they'd say, you know, can you tell me who, who, who took that picture? And Ken was proud of that. He'd say, well, I did. I took that picture. And they'd say, oh, okay. Because that's my Aunt Joni and my Uncle Howard, and that's our car right there. And it wasn't. But everybody thought they were in that picture. You know? <laughs> they remembered being at the Straits. That's how people looked. That's how the cars looked. And that it had to be them, they thought. But of course, it, it wasn't. But uh, he had a lot of fun with that over the years. So the bridge was all set to open up on November the 1st of 1957. And I'm going to introduce to you a man now who helped me a lot with this book and who wrote the foreword for it, Larry Rubin. Larry Rubin was the executive secretary of the Mackinac Bridge Authority. He died at the age of 94 about six years ago. 
And Larry was an incredible guy. And uh, he told me that um, they came to him and said, uh, Lawrence, we're ready to open on November the 1st. And he said, well, are you sure? They said, yeah, we're going to make it. We're going to be there November the 1st. By the way, they finished paving the roads a day and a half before the actual opening ceremony. So they just got done in time. But we want you to have a, a nice ceremony, something to really open up the bridge. We're going to have the governor here. We're going to invite all the media. There's going to be lots of people coming here. So put it together, will you? Now, how are you feeling about doing something outdoors in Mackinac on November 1st? You know, probably not a good idea. And so the whole idea was, you know, how do we pull this off? And Larry Rubin said that he, he went back to them and he said, look, we'll open the bridge that day and we'll have the ceremony and we'll have a first toll get paid by the governor. But let's have a dedication the following June, third weekend in June, and the weather will be perfect and everybody will come up for that. You'll get a lot more people. So they said, Larry, you're a genius. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it that way. So November 1st came, and, you know, it was kind of spit and rain, a little foggy. You could see the bridge, but in the morning it was uh, not uncomfortable. Uh, you see raincoats, but no real heavy top coats, no wind blowing, unseasonably warm for a November 1st in the Straits. And the headline in the newspaper said, Michigan is one. Our state had finally been joined. It was united. No more ferries carrying cars across for $3.25. Now it was the real deal. We had a bridge. And so uh, things proceeded nicely that day. And the governor was there, and he was riding in a, uh, a convertible. And Mrs. Williams was right next to him. And, and there's Larry Rubin at the wheel driving. Prentice M. Brown wearing a hat right behind Larry Rubin. And they stopped out at Center Span. And they uh, posed for a quick photo that the bridge authority took. And then they were ready to go and leading this procession of cars, which had the governors of all the other 47 states. <laughs> Every other governor came to Mackinac to see this bridge because it was such a big deal. I mean, can you imagine getting all the, they can't even get the governors to show up. I mean, that's, that's tough today, right? Everybody's busy. But then they were all there. And they all came across. And so they got this picture taken. And uh, Larry Rubin said, OK, well, we're all set. He said, uh, I'm, I'm, Mrs. Williams said, what, what is all that noise? He said, well, that's all the people. You can hear them down there in St. Ignace, can't you? There's about 5,000 people down there. They're really ready for you, Governor. You know, we, we want to get you at the wheel now. And you'll drive through, and you'll pay the first fare. And uh, we've got 150 newspapers there. And all the television networks are there with their, their film cameras. And everybody's ready for you, you know? And he said, sounds good. Let's go. He reached for the car door. And Mrs. Williams said, Soapy, don't drive. He said, oh, I'm not worried about that. Let's go. She said, Soapy. She put her hand on his arm and said, don't drive the car. And Larry came up and said, Governor? Mrs. Williams, what's the problem? This is, this is going to be a big, huge news. This, is going to, this picture is going to be in every newspaper everywhere. We need to have the governor at the wheel here. Mrs. Williams just stood back. You know, governors don't often drive themselves. They usually have a chauffeur. It seems that our governor had failed to renew his driver's license. <laughs> and Mrs. Williams being a pretty sharp cookie, knew that somewhere in Lansing, in an office somewhere, somebody was going to see that picture and know that he wasn't licensed to drive and tell people. <laughs> see, politics are no different, are they? It's the same way. So they came down the slope, and they went uh, right through the, uh, on the causeway and headed towards the toll booths. And as they got there, they started to slow down. And those 5,000 people surged forward. They didn't wait for them to even come to the toll booth. Everybody surged forward to greet the governor and welcome him. And you know, as they came through, who was at the wheel that day? Mrs. Williams. <laughs> She's driving the car. And the governor is seated in the middle, and Prentice M. Brown's having a good laugh in the back, and boy, oh boy, they're ready to go. Now, I get this question a lot, and so I'll offer it here, because I have to tell you that it was answered correctly 
last week in Iron Mountain, Michigan. They brought it up, and somebody asked me, and somebody in Iron Mountain knew this, but I have to tell you that just a few months ago, I was next door in Farmington Hills, and nobody knew who that is with the microphone doing that interview, and you know, because it's who? Mort Neff. Neff. There you go. And people, I don't know. People in Iron Mountain knew who that was. Maybe they'd, they'd moved up there after a while, but I'm amazed in Farmington Hills, here we are in a Detroit suburb. They watched him on television every night, and I asked and nobody knew, and I said, oh, come on, doesn't that, doesn't that ring a bell? Look at him very closely, and some lady said, it's Ernie Harwell. <laughs> it was not Ernie Harwell. <laughs> not, not, not true, not true. So next they got up to the toll booth, and it was time to pay the ceremonial first toll. They had a big check made out, out of cardboard, and then they were going to have Prentice M. Brown get in the toll booth and accept the check from the governor. So the governor got out of the car and stood there, and Prentice M. Brown got in the toll booth, and he grabbed the toll collector's hat off of his head and put it on, and he stood there, and they did what in the newspaper business we call a grip and grin, where you're gripping the check and grinning and shaking hands, you know? And they did that. And uh, there you go, and that was the first toll, and we're all set. And, and uh, the governor left, and, and uh, Prentice M. Brown turned around and gave the check back to the, stuck that down there next to the, the toll booth guy and gave him his hat back and started to leave. And tap on the shoulder. Sir, we don't accept checks at the Mackinac Bridge. <laughs> so. Back then they didn't, so it was, uh, somebody had to reach in their pocket. So. But you know, the bridge was open, and boy, the traffic took off. And people came across, and it didn't matter whether they were coming uh, north to south or south to north. Uh, the bridge was open, and I-75 wasn't yet. It wasn't even, uh, you know, an interstate highway yet. That was still being built. And uh, they had some struggles with some of the signs because uh, as things moved and highways were completed and exit ramps began to take place, we'd never seen anything like that up there before, uh, an exit ramp that went around like this. And... Uh, some of the signage needed to be updated over, over a while, and uh, people were having problems with some of the signs. And there was a truck driver that came across from Montana, and uh, this was the bridge had only been open for a few days, and he drove across, and as he, he got to St. Ignace, why, he paid the fare, and then he, he uh, got out, and he circled around on US-2, and he started to head west, and then he saw the signs, and he got off the exit ramp, and he turned around, and he came back across the bridge, and then he got over in Mackinac City, and. He turned around and got off the bridge, and he came back, and he came back across, and he came back to St. Ignace, and he said to the toll collector, how many bridges you got like this up here? <laughs> people had never seen anything like that before, and they just didn't know, you know. But uh, people wanted to be the first, you know. Uh, there was people that waited in line for a long time to be the first to cross that bridge. And the very first car, other than the governor's, the first public car, was a band leader, a jazz drummer from Chicago who liked to be first with things. And he had a station wagon, and he was the first car to go through the toll booth. Somebody had the first motorcycle. Somewhere there's some guy that's telling his grandkids, you know, I drove the first semi across that bridge, because somebody did, you know. And that's just the, the way it was. And of course, the bridge opened uh, on November the 1st of 1957. So let's move ahead now to June of 58. And now the weather's going to be perfect even though it wasn't bad November 1st. I mean, nobody really had a problem with the weather, but this is going to be ideal. So the governor is wearing the bow tie, and he's standing there at the booth and ready to talk, and he's ready to introduce Prentice M. Brown and David Steinman, and they're going to tie together some green ribbon. You've got two and a half miles of green ribbon going all the way back to Mackinac City and two and a half miles of green ribbon going all the way back to St. Ignace. There's Mackinac Island off in the distance. And uh, this is going to signify, you know, that Michigan really is one. So they're having this ceremony. And this is probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, uh, typical for June. I mean, shirt sleeves, uh, everybody's comfortable. This is, this is perfect. Larry, Larry said, I just felt so smart because I had told them to do it this way. And this was going to be perfect, you know. Well, they finished up with a ceremony, and now it was time to get ready for the big parade because they had invited the county queens of the entire state of Michigan to come to the Straits and be in a parade. And everybody wanted to get involved with the bridge. You know, if you weren't one of the people that signed on early to be their insurance company or to uh, 
work on something at the toll booth or something. You wanted to be. And everybody wanted to get involved. And Oldsmobile stepped up out of Lansing and said, there's a parade. We want to be involved. We will give a white convertible to every queen for the use of that week during the ceremonies. All she has to do is go to her local Oldsmobile dealer and pick up the car. Have her dad pick up the car. Her dad can drive the car. Mom can ride along. And all they have to do is sit there in the back and, and do the wave, you know. Give us the list. Tell us who the queens are. We'll make sure there's a car there. And it happened. It happened. By noon, those cars were going across the bridge. And what a sight that was to see all those county queens <laughs> all riding in those convertibles and waving. And uh, it was just amazing that that worked out so well. And as soon as the parade was done, now it was time to get ready for the trade fair. Because Larry Rubin, in his wisdom, said, you know, we have all these companies that want to be involved at the bridge, and they can't. Let's give them some way to be involved. Let's have a trade fair. We'll put it on the dock, because there's no more ferry boats anymore. So we'll have the trade fair on the dock. They can set up booths, and it'll give people something to do in the afternoon. They can walk through and get free things, you know? So that's what they did. And, you know, every car company was there, every utility in Michigan, every bank in Michigan. All the big corporations were represented. All the insurance companies, everybody was there. Somebody was scooping ice cream out and giving it to the kids in cones. And the next booth, you'd get a T-shirt that had the name of a bank and then the Mackinac Bridge picture on the front. The next booth had a pen. Somebody had a ball cap, pamphlets advertising their services. All this is going on. It started at 1 o'clock. You know, about 20 after 1, people noticed that the air seemed different. And the sun was kind of getting hazy and disappearing, and it started to get real cloudy. At 1.40, we had straight-line winds come through the straits of 65 miles an hour. <laughs> the booths were toppled. Things were blowing away in the breeze. Pamphlets were fluttering going into the straits. People were running for cover because it was raining in sheets. Just terrible. It was better weather November 1st. You know? <laughs> it actually was. And so... Um, it was almost like Mother Nature was saying, how dare you think that you can build a bridge across these straits? I could make real problems for you. But you know what? That bridge stood strong. There was no issue. David Steinman had built the bridge to withstand two and one-half times all the recorded stresses of Mother Nature. Two and one-half times stronger than the currents, than the highest waves, than the thickest ice. Six times stronger than the highest winds recorded at the Straits. And the bridge stood strong. There was no problem. And we thought, wow, this really is a wonder of the world to have this Mackinac Bridge. People wanted to get souvenirs of the bridge. I lost my parents in the last three years and, and cleaning out the house, you know. I found a box that had my name on it. And I was so pleased out of all our kids that I got these iced tea glasses that had Mackinac Bridge on them. You know, they're frosted and, you know, those three days in July where it's actually 90 degrees, you know, you, I can sit out on my deck and I can look at the bridge and have an iced tea and it's just, it's just wonderful. It's still that way today, but back then, boy, everybody uh, offered souvenirs about the bridge. You know, you came to Mackinac or St. Ignace and I mean, it was everything. It was on ashtrays, it was on clothing, everything was Mackinac Bridge and today it's still, you still see an awful lot of that. The state got that way too. They wanted to use the bridge to promote the state of Michigan. Uh, you know, come up to the bridge and go across to the UP and go skiing, you know. Uh, come up and go snowmobiling in the UP. Although I think this picture was taken in July because she's got short sleeves on, you know. First, you know, the bridge opened November 1st, and we never thought back then that we would see it. But today, you know, we see the bridge on our license plates, several designs that show the Mackinac Bridge. And I bet you just about everybody in this room is a licensed driver, and in your pocket or purse, you've got a picture of the Mackinac Bridge because the bridge is on every one of our driver's licenses, you know? People wanted to be seen on the bridge. John F. Kennedy, running for president in 1960. Bridge had been open three years. He came to Detroit, he came to Grand Rapids. Soapy Williams talked to him and said, Jack, you've got to connect with the Upper Peninsula. You know, you got to get up there and let these people in the UP see you. You know, where was he going to go? Newberry? 
I mean, <laughs> how, do you, how do you appeal to those people? And Soapy Williams said, come to the Mackinac Bridge. Get your picture taken on the bridge, and it'll, it'll, it'll ring true with people. And, and it did. And, of course, he won that election. I mean, he was very popular, you know. Remember Lyndon Johnson's wife, Lady Bird? Lady Bird Johnson, she, like a lot of first ladies, had their picture taken on the bridge, and that usually would happen after they had decorated a room at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. And you probably know that there are no two rooms alike on the Grand Hotel, almost 400 rooms now, and every one is different in its decor. Well, the first ladies usually do the colors of their state. So although this is a black and white photo, I'll bet you a nickel that's a yellow dress because Lady Bird Johnson did her room in, in goldenrod yellow and, and uh, blue bonnet blue, the colors of the state of Texas. Remember Haas from Bonanza? There he is at the toll booth. The actor's name was Dan Blocker, and uh, he uh, was on Bonanza, that TV show. It was brought to you by Chevrolet, if you recall. And Chevrolet thought that you know they should use the bridge in their advertising, a national commercial. And they used the Mackinac Bridge, had an aerial shot of Chevy trucks driving on the Mackinac Bridge. And Dan Blocker's voice is on that commercial. I can't imitate him, but it says, there's something a-coming, something big, Chevy trucks. And there they were. And afterwards, uh, Dan Blocker signed autographs for the kids in St. Agnes wearing that big 10-gallon hat and the leather vest. And Boy, what a, what a neat day that was, you know. But to be first, you know, Everybody wanted to have something first. Some guy called the bridge after it had been open a couple weeks and said, uh, I want to be first at something. Is there anything that somebody hasn't done? <laughs> he said, well, we have no idea. I mean, what are you talking about? He said, well, I don't know. I'm just thinking, has anybody driven across the bridge backwards in reverse? They said, no, nobody's done that. He said, well, I'm coming up Thursday. Can I do it? They said, no. <laughs> We're not letting you do that. But the bridge opened November 1st, and two weeks later, you know, what was it? Hunting season, right? There's the first deer coming back from the UP. There's the first traffic accident. The bridge authority started taking pictures of things because it was first. These were first things to happen on the bridge. So they were able to, to get some of those photographs, and I've got those in the book. The toll booths were a, a great design because they could allow traffic to be admitted uh, from different directions according to the flow of traffic. So. Uh, you know, a Friday afternoon and everybody's heading north, you have more lanes open from that direction. Uh, Sunday, when everybody's coming back, you open more from the north. The idea is keep people moving. Don't make them wait. That's the whole goal, is to have everybody safe, but to make them not wait in line. And uh, on the toll, uh, it was 325 for a car that first year because that's what they charged for the ferry. So why change it? We didn't want one person complaining, saying, oh, I wish we still had the ferry boat. You know, it was cheaper. No way. Three and a quarter, just like the boat, except this is going to get you across a lot faster, a lot faster. And I can remember the first time I crossed the bridge, it was 325. And my grandpa got uh, all my cousins together. It was, it was before Christmas. I think there was some kind of a Christmas party that we were all at, but there we were, and he said, you kids all get in that station wagon. I'm going to take you across that bridge today. My heart just about jumped out of my chest. I was so excited. I thought, I am going to be so high up in the air. This is going to be incredible. I had my little Boy Scout camera. Got up on that bridge, and we went across, and I couldn't believe how high in the sky we were. And you could see a ship way down there and clouds and islands. And it was just so beautiful, even though it was a cold December day. And we got down onto the causeway and headed toward the toll booth. And as we got closer and closer to the toll booth, the traffic was starting to back up just a little bit. And my grandpa said, you kids, hang on. And we all held on. And my grandpa turned and did a U-turn, <laughs> headed right back to Mackinac City. <laughs> we thought that was hilarious. We got back to the house, and everybody was yucking it up and laughing about it. And I saw my grandmother get my grandpa out in the hallway. And she said, Fred, what were you thinking with all those kids in the car? He said, I didn't mind spending $3.25 to show them a good time for 15 minutes or so, but they were going to charge me to come back. 
And our bridge has always done that. It's always charged a two-way toll. Big bridges in the east and on the west coast don't. They charge one fare, but it's higher. You pay more, but you pay one way. The feeling was, if we did that, it was going to make it like you had to pay to get into the UP. And they didn't want that. They wanted this to open the UP, not be a barrier. And people said, well, why don't you charge the other direction? Actually, there's a much higher traffic flow going north than there is going south. So it would have meant a significant loss in revenue had they charged that direction. So they've always charged both ways. And that's the way that it's always been since the beginning of time. But at the end of that first year, they had their meeting and they looked at the numbers. And I think the Mackinac Bridge Authority people's jaws just about hit the table because they said, my goodness, am I reading this right? We're barely making the bond payment. They said, that's right. A lot less people crossed the bridge in the first year than we thought. But we're able to make the bond payment, but just barely. They said, well, this is, this is like by the skin of our teeth. I said, true, but more people will cross the bridge next year. They said, well, what if they don't? Well, there was a lot of discussion about that. And they finally decided what they would do is just to be sure they would raise the fare. So they raised it to 350. And after the second year, they had their meeting. And you know what? Fewer people crossed the bridge in year two than had crossed the bridge in the first year. They were barely able to make the bond payment. The only way they made it was because they had raised the fare. Now what do you do? Well, there's nothing we can do but raise it again. So they did. They raised it to 375. And you know about then, it really became evident that people didn't have the money that would come up there. That was a lot of money in the 50s, a lot of money. A friend of mine that worked on the bridge used to tell me that he got paid more than anybody he knew for working out there. I said, well, how much? How much did you get paid? He said, well, I made more than anybody. I said, right, but how much money was that? He said, well, I climbed, and I worked at night, and I had the highest rating in my union. I, I had more experience. I got paid more than anybody that I knew out there. I said, right. How much was that? He said, well, he said, by the time it was all done, I was up to $3.55 an hour. $3.55 an hour was a pretty good wage back in 1957. So three seventy-five to cross the bridge, a lot of money. People would come up to the toll booth and they would say, uh, uh, yeah, um, three seventy-five now? Uh, yeah, they had to raise the fare. Oh. Um, hey, would you take $2? <laughs> no, we can't take $2. You have to pay the whole fare. Well, I don't have it. Well, you have to pay. Everybody has to pay. If you don't have the money, then get out of line, and you can go in the office and see what they'll do for you. Maybe they can work something out. I don't know. Well, people, they start digging in the cushions of the seat. They look in the glove box. Everybody in the car, check your pockets. They'd come up with the money. It seemed like people just didn't want to pay. You know, people would come across and they would say, I'm not paying one more cent in tax to the state of Michigan. They said, this has nothing to do with tax. This is the Mackinac Bridge Authority. It's a private entity. You have to pay the 375, you know. People would come up with excuses. They'd come across the bridge and they would say, oh, well, I don't have to pay. Why not? And she said, can't you see? I've got a whole carload of Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts don't have to pay to cross the Mackinac Bridge. Well, they do, actually. <laughs> you know? And it went on and on and on like that. And now here they were at $3.75, and they had another meeting at the end of year three. And what do you think the numbers said? Yeah, people were coming to the Straits from either direction. They were staying in a motel, buying food to eat, getting a box of fudge, and going home. They weren't crossing that bridge. It wasn't doing what they needed it to do. The next step was the amount that the fare is today, $4. That's what it costs today. They were going to go to $4. And somebody said, why don't we lower the fare? Lower the fare? Are you out of your mind? We're going to have to crawl back to the legislators and try to get that indenture clause invoked, and that's going to be humiliating. We don't want to do that. What are you talking about? Like, go back to $350? No, lower. You mean like $325 like it first was? No, really lower it. You know, they did. They dropped it down to $1.50 for a car. 
And that opened up the UP. That turned the trick. Everybody had $1.50. It just seemed like that was a magic number. It was a price point that was perfect. People could pay $1.50 to get across the bridge. And that made the traffic go, go wild. And every year, there's more people that cross the bridge. And there's been some years where it's been down a little, but then it goes back up, and it's more and more, and then it goes down a little. We've had a couple years where it's dropped off a hair, but it's still always increasing, always increasing. So $1.50 was in effect for over 40 years. And now its uh, maintenance costs have, have increased, and so it costs more. The bonds, by the way, were paid off in 1986. So all that money was repaid, and now it's just tolls that they operate on. And they get uh, uh, all the maintenance paid for, and the people that work at the bridge get paid out of the tolls. And, of course, $4 is the, the least expensive except for a motorcycle. But buses pay more, trucks pay more, they pay the big, the big heavy fares. For a while, locals wanted to know why we couldn't get a break, you know? Why should we have to pay more? I mean, we cross the bridge all the time. You know, when the, when the ferry boats ran, Mackinac City people didn't really know people in St. Ignace. I mean, if you were headed north, unless they were your relatives, I mean, you'd keep going. You'd get off the boat and go on to Marquette. You know, you'd go on to Houghton, Duluth, wherever. If you were coming from the north, your goal was to get to Detroit or to get to Grand Rapids or Lansing. You didn't stop at Mackinac City just to see somebody unless they were your, your relatives. So it was different. Now with the bridge, people were using the bridge to commute. They were going back and forth all the time. And now it's that way today. You know, the schools cooperate, the libraries cooperate, the uh, sports teams play each other. It's one community, even though Mackinac City is only 878 people and St. Ignace is 2,700. We're like, almost like one town, you know? It's the Straits area is what it is. You know, we don't have a veterinarian in Mackinac City. St. Ignace has three. You need to take your dog or your cat to the vet, you go to St. Ignace. Mackinac City doesn't have a hospital. They have a health clinic that's a branch of the hospital that's in St. Ignace. So you can go in and get your checkup, get your flu shot in Mackinac City, but if something's up, you're going to go to the hospital in St. Ignace. They'll take care of you over there, see. St. Ignace has a bowling alley. Eight lanes. Mackinac City doesn't have a bowling alley. If you're going to go bowling, you go to St. Ignace. St. Ignace is the bigger town. They don't have a movie theater. Mackinac City is the smaller community, but we've got five screens in the Mackinac Crossings. <laughs> so people from St. Ignace come to Mackinac City to see a movie. See? That's how, that's how it works. St. Ignace has two barber shops. Mackinac City hasn't had a barber shop in almost 20 years. But you knew that as soon as you met me, right? <laughs> so the bridge said, look, let's give you a script book. You locals can buy a book of tickets. And then you only have to pay a dollar instead of a dollar fifty. Well, that was a good deal. You save fifty cents on a crossing, you know? Okay. And it was a nice thing too, because you didn't have to dig for change. You didn't have to make sure you had the money every day. You just had a book of tickets. You stick it up above your visor, and then when you go across, you pull out a ticket and away you go. The gate opens up and you're through. You know, it's pretty nice. But then they realized they had to keep printing tickets. The tickets were only used once. And that didn't work. So it was costing a lot to keep printing the tickets again. So they had to come up with something different. Let's do tokens. So they came up with a token thing where you'd buy a pack of tokens and you could toss that in the basket and then you just go buy more tokens. The same tokens get reused. That was going to be better. You know what the problem was? The basket was always filling up with snow. <laughs> and people would toss the token in there and it wouldn't go anywhere in the snow. And the bridge thought, well, hey, this is going to be good because we can hire fewer toll collectors because the basket will be automated, you know. And uh, what would happen is, even in the springtime, you know, it would be no snow, but it's still cold, and it'd rain and stuff. And they'd throw the coin in, and it'd get stuck in the mechanism because the mechanism would freeze up. So here she is working in the toll booth, and she looks, and all of a sudden there's five, six cars backed up, and people are starting to honk their horns. So she has to leave her toll booth, go over and take a thing like a, a, a coat hanger and try and get that coin to work. And in the meantime, her lane's backing up five or six cars. It wasn't the answer. So now we have a Mac pass. 
and the Mac Pass is like a like a debit card, and you put money on the debit card, and then you just hold it up, and the laser scanner reads it, and up goes the gate, and away you go. And uh, they also now accept credit cards, which they didn't until about a year ago, and now they can take debit or credit cards, and they have software that has gotten the time of the transaction down to 16 seconds. And the new software that they're working on is being used in one lane only now to test it. It's doing the job in 12 seconds. So they're trying to speed it up to get you across. And starting in October, they will now, if you have a Mac Pass, they're going to give you a sticker that you put on. And when you go through, the scanner will read your sticker, and the gate goes up, and it gets charged automatically to your card. And people say, well, we've been to states where they have these easy passes. That's a state-by-state -state thing, and they're not affiliated with the state. It's a private entity, and they can't do the easy pass. So they're trying this other thing. So it's probably going to work out well, I think. I've got a chapter in the book called Toll Booth Tales. It's the stories all the people tell the, the toll collectors. The toll collectors tell me what they say when they come across, you know. And uh, some of it is, is absolutely hilarious. Some of it's just crazy. But, you know, people drive a long way, and they sometimes they've been in the car since Detroit, you know. And they've been in the car since Duluth. And they get to the bridge, and they just want to talk to somebody, you know. <laughs> so these are nice people, and they engage you in conversation, and it works out pretty well. And, you know, they ask questions that are well-meaning, but sometimes come out kind of humorous, you know. Like the people that come up and the lady that says, uh, tell me, do you have any restaurants up here? <laughs> no, we don't eat food, so we wouldn't have any restaurants, you know. <laughs> or sometimes they ask directions, you know. Uh, yeah, can you tell me which way does U.S. 2 West go? <laughs> That's kind of like Grant's tomb, you know, the answer to that question, you know. Sometimes when they come across, they'll ask things that are rather obvious, but uh, they're legitimate. I mean, people want to know this stuff. Like the guy who said, yeah, can you tell me which lakes did I just cross? Okay, she was going to tell him that. So she said, well, you came from the south, so to the west, to your left, that was Lake Michigan. And to your right, to the east, that was Lake Huron. And he said, oh, OK. And then his wife's sitting there. She says, which lake do they get the smoked fish from? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. This, this, is, this really happens, you know. And as I said, they're friendly people. And, and uh, I was in line, uh, gosh, that's probably been about the end of June, maybe, middle of June, something like that. And I noticed that there was a car in front of me in, in the lane I was going through. And uh, I'm not the type to honk a horn or something, but I, after a while I noticed I've been sitting there almost a minute, you know. <laughs> uh, what's going on? And now it was 90 seconds. And as I looked ahead, I could see that, you know, I could see his arm coming out of the window of the car. And what I saw was, was this, you know. <laughs> and then... I noticed that out of the toll booth was her arm. <laughs> you know, rarely do I have a screen where I can do that. That was, that was me. <laughs> Finally, the car started to move. So they pulled ahead, and he, then he stopped. And he went back, and he had one more parting shot. Like that. And then he drove off. So I got up there and I said to her, I said, I said, Aggie, what was going on there? She said, what are you talking about? I said, the guy in front of me, he was waving his arms and everything. She says, oh, she was, we were just saying it looks like it's going to be another long summer for the Tigers. <laughs> 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 that's, that's what they were talking about, you know. But people come up and they expect the toll collectors to know things about everything. And they're not allowed to have a radio in there or a TV or a phone. They have to concentrate on what they're doing, you know. All they do all day long is make change and run cards now if they got that, you know. But they just make change constantly, constantly, constantly. You approach the bridge and you see signs, three of them. As you're coming to the bridge and then as you're coming to the toll booth, it lists all the different types of vehicles. And on the top is a picture of a car. And it says $4. And they get there, and they say, how much is it? <laughs> and she says, $4. Oh, oh, OK, uh, $4, uh, yeah. Um, oh, do you have change for a 10? 
You don't think she's got change for a $10 bill in there, you know? I mean, really, you know? <laughs> Sometimes when they come across, they uh, ask about the weather. You know, oh my, is it snowing this bad in Marquette? How does she know, you know? <laughs> is it this foggy down in Bay City? You got me, you know? She has no idea, you know? Sometimes they want to talk about other things like sports, like I said, you know. I mean, there's the one that happens in the fall all the time on Sunday afternoons, and that's an easy one. People pull up and they say, hey, did the Lions win? They just automatically say, no. <laughs> it works out great. You know? And then there's the one that they get once a day in the summer, guaranteed. And I know it's true because my kids got it when they worked in the marina and they worked in the gift shop and they worked in the hotel. Somebody every day will come to you and say, can you tell me what time does the bridge swing over to Mackinac Island? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> you think that bridge moves? <laughs> they don't know, you know, so they want to know. How about the day somebody came to the toll booth and said, hey, do you know there's a deer out in the middle of the bridge? No, they didn't know that. Two and a half miles that deer walked to get out there, and nobody said a word at the toll booth. And finally, somebody brought it up, and it was halfway across the bridge. They had to walk it back to Mackinac City. I mean, you know. A little bit about some interesting features about the bridge. David Steinman put 31 finger joints in the bridge. It's almost like if I put my hands together and then laid it flat. Those finger joints can stretch the bridge. The engineers tell me that if you had wall-to-wall -wall semis, all four lanes, Mackinac City to St. Ignace and back again, the bridge, five miles long, could become 28 feet longer than it really is, just by stretching, okay? Same with the uh, side stay cables. Um, Steinman put those graded lanes in the middle, you know, the ones you don't like to drive on. Those are there because it allows air to flow through. Rain can drip through, so you don't have standing water on the bridge, and consequently, you shouldn't have ice. And they don't salt the bridge in the winter, they sand it. So that is an aerodynamic feature that helps the bridge flex. It doesn't resist Mother Nature at all, it just flexes. The side stay cables that I talked about are held up by the main cables. The main cables are about the size of a number two lead pencil and there's 41,000 miles of cable. The cable's banded together into a circumference about like my arm. Those are banded together, and pretty soon you've got a 24 and a quarter inch column that's encased in a pipe. The towers hold those up, and then the cables hold up the side stake cables, and those are attached to the roadway, and those hold up the roadway. Somebody has to climb up the cables and change the light bulbs. They're not LED yet, but they're going to be. They're LED on the roadway now, but the actual bridge lights are not. They change the bulbs and they change the globes, and the globes are colored, so they can make different color combinations. Like if you're up there in July, you'll see red, white, and blue, patriotic, you know. In the fall, they'll switch to all amber for Halloween, Thanksgiving. Christmas time, red, blue, green. Uh, the last few years in April, they've done a whole month of April all blue for Autism Awareness Month. They can do things like that with those, those globes. The towers are 552 feet tall. That's the part above the water line. Think about that. Each tower stands in 210 feet of water. Each tower's caisson base goes more than 100 feet through the bottom of the lake into bedrock. When David Steinman spoke at the November 1st bridge opening, he said, the Mackinac Bridge Towers are anchored for eternity. And everybody kind of got wide-eyed, you know. He came back in June and said, I want to correct a statement I made. I said that the Mackinac Bridge Towers are anchored for eternity, and I no longer believe that to be true. Everybody th thought, wow, when's the bridge going to fall down? He said, I now believe that the Mackinac Bridge will still be standing when the pyramids of Egypt have vanished. Wow. How smart a guy was David Steinman. I met his grandson, and I asked him about this thing about Steinman, his grandpa, being a genius. 
a math genius. After all, he employed 150 engineers to build the bridge, and they accounted for every rivet, every nut and bolt, every inch of steel, every inch of cabling, and did it all with logarithms and slide rules, no computers, you know. Very smart guy. And his grandson said, well, the best example I can give you is, is the story about him in grade school. Do you know that one? I said, no. What? He said, well, he said, my grandpa was kind of an afterthought. He said he had two older sisters. And he said he used to go next door from the grade school he was in to their high school and wait for them to get out of math class. And they'd walk him home. And the math teacher that his sisters had would give him candy for correct math answers. I said, what kind of math answers? He said, well, that's the best part. He said, my grandfather had mastered double-digit multiplication, two numbers times two numbers, in the second grade. Wow. Pretty smart guy. Pretty smart guy. There's an elevator in each of the towers. It holds two and a half people. <laughs> I've been up there three times. It's going to be you and whoever you bring along and the bridge guy you're going to be real close to the bridge guy. <laughs> you climb in through a, a hatch that's shaped like an, like an elongated oval, like on a ship, like a submarine, and I'm tall. Getting my leg up over that thing was difficult, hitting my shoulder, bumping my ear. You get inside. It's not like an elevator in an office building. It's just stainless steel. There's a light bulb hanging there. It's drafty. If it's hot outside, it's really hot in there. If it's cold outside, it's really cold in there. And you go up about 100 feet per minute, really slow. And it can go from the water line to the bridge deck, any of those stations all the way up to the top. When you get to the top, you climb out, and you've got to climb out the same type of a hatch, and then you go this way, and there's crisscrossing beams. You've got to climb over those. Whatever you're wearing, you're going to get dirty. You go all the way to the wall. Unlike the ladder that we have angled to clean out the gutters, there's rungs that come out of the wall, and you climb straight up 30 feet to get to the top. And then the bridge guy undogs the hatch and flips the hatch over, and then you climb out, and you're on top of the world. Because you can see for, it's like forever when you're up there. And there's a railing. I mean, the railing is probably code, so code is going to be like a doorknob or a, a railing, you know, like these tables are probably pretty close to, to code. The first time I was up there, I swear those railings were below my knees. <laughs> they looked so low. I thought, I'm going to lose my glasses, I'm going to lose my hat, my camera, everything's going to fly away, you know. And um, bridge tower tours used to be something that were pretty accessible. You could get to do that. Um, if you knew somebody or if you were patient, you know, you showed up early in the day and you said you were willing to wait and is there a chance that we could get to the top of the tower? Somebody from maintenance, if they had time, they'd probably do it, you know. All that changed on September 11th of 2001. No more. Now, the only way you can get to the top of the tower is if you win uh, a lottery or an auction that maybe your charitable organization would put on because the bridge gives a certain number of tower tours to groups that have a 501c3 tax designation. And they allow them to auction it off or have a, you know, a, a drawing or something. And uh, some of these have gone for $3,500 in auctions. So I mean, it's a, it's a big deal to be able to get up there anymore. But uh, if you win, you'll be vetted. They're going to do a background check on you. They want to know who you are, what you've done, what your story is, because they don't want somebody causing a problem up there, you know. It's just a different world, you know, today. Back in the day, I mean, you know, they would do them all the time. In fact, a friend of mine uh, used to give tours, and he said that one day they called him up, and they, he, was, he was working on something back in the shop, and they said, hey, can you give a bridge tour? We got some people here from an insurance company that we're working with. Can you take them, take them up there? He said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. He got over there. There were 11 of them, 11 people, and they all wanted to go to the top. Can you imagine how long that took? Two at a time, taking them up, getting, coming back down empty, taking two more up, coming back down empty. You know, it took a while. The last guy had like a raincoat on. It was a really windy day. And he just was wearing a raincoat. Didn't say much. Quiet. Getting on in the elevator, going up there. Didn't, didn't offer much. Climbed up the, the ladder, got out there. My friend started into his spiel, you know. 
Everybody's standing over here now. So, okay, so this is uh, St. Ignace. And over there is Mackinac City. There's Mackinac Island. There's Round Island. There's Bobla. He's talking, and the people are over here. And this guy is over here by himself at the rail, just standing here, you know. And he thought, why is this guy over here? You know, come over here so I don't have to shout to everybody, you know. And he's watching the guy while he's talking. And every once he he'd look over at him. Finally, he sees that the guy is unbuttoning his coat. He's reaching inside his coat, and he brings out this box. And he opens up the box, and he's got a plastic bag in it. And he unzips the plastic bag, and it's just windy as all get out. And he starts to shake this bag like this. And his buddies are saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And my friend said, what are you doing? The wind's too windy. What, what do you got there? What do you got there? He turned around. He said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, my neighbor helped build the bridge, and I told his widow I'd scatter his ashes from up here. You know. All of his friends had cremains in their hair, in their face. It was all over them, you know. I mean, it's a very fine dust, and it was just all over. And uh, one of the guys said, uh, was it Robert? Which neighbor was it? Was it Robert? And he said, yeah, it's Robert. And the guy leaned over the railing, and he said, Robert, I feel terrible. This is so disrespectful. <laughs> These things happen. Bridge has been hit by lightning many times. Very strong, very well grounded. Fiber optic cables and uh, different communication cables that go across the bridge. Nothing affected because it's just so well grounded into that bedrock that Steinman uh, bypassed all that limestone completely and just went right into bedrock to ground the bridge. They take real good care of it maintenance wise. They're always keeping it clean, keeping the snow off of it. They got to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, yes, the bridge does close. Um, wind conditions can do it. Uh, whiteout conditions can do it. But most of the time when the bridge closes, it's because ice is falling from the cables or the towers. And that happens in April and March. And the sun hits it at a certain angle, and they can watch it with binoculars, and they can tell when it's going to stop, when the angle changes. And then they know it's not going to do it again, so they can open up the traffic again. So that's all. Uh, all happening all the time. Uh, if you need special accommodations to cross the bridge, you stop at the toll booth from the north. If you're coming from the south, uh, there's a booth that you see here right in front of Audie's restaurant, and you just go in there, you can make a phone call. Hey, I need uh, transportation to cross the bridge. I'm, I'm a pedestrian. They'll come and pick you up. They'll take you across. They charge you, not as much as a car, but they'll get you to the other side. They're open for business. They're open to help you cross the straits. Uh, if you're on your bicycle, you can't ride your bike on the bridge. So they've got a pickup truck that has a bike rack in the back. They can carry four bikes. Extended cab, they can carry four passengers. They'll get you to the other side. Well, we're on our snowmobiles. No problem. In the winter, they have a flatbed truck that can carry eight snowmobiles. And they go rest area to rest area. And they'll take you across. You don't want to drive a snowmobile across the straits. The, the Mackinaw is out there cutting ice. And that's not going to end well for you. <laughs> so that's how that works. Um, all that's taken care of right in the booth. Uh, they keep track of every, every single admission, or every single crossing, I should say. Uh, they know how much you pay. They know what class your vehicle was. They scan your license plate now into a computer automatically, just like at the border. And you know, people come to the toll booth, and they say, do you need to see my passport? They think they're going into Canada, but they're, they're not, you know. But they scan your license plate, so it's a good thing for law enforcement, too, because you know, the police will call and the state police will get a call. It's right across the street. The post is right across from the bridge. And they'll get a call and they'll say, hey, somebody just held up the bank in Rochester Hills. You know, did they head north? Well, what are we looking for? Well, you know, it's a small red pickup. It's got this license plate. Okay. No, nope, haven't seen them yet. Okay, thank you. You know what? Two and a half hours later, a little red bar might start to flash and that's that computer screen. And she'll see that. And she'll just pick up the phone and call the state police, say, I've got your pickup sitting right here at the toll booth right now. He's going through right now. Have you got eyes on him? Yep, I can see him. He's getting off at the first St. Ignace exit. You know what? They're going to have that guy in handcuffs in three minutes. It's just not going to take long because of that system. So it works out really well. And it helps save time for the toll collectors, too, because they don't have to answer the same kind of questions on phone calls that they used to get all the time. I mean, even to this day, they get calls at that office, and people call up and they say, yeah, did you see a blue van pulling a boat? 
How many do you think she's seen in the last half hour, you know? And then there's the one that used to happen a lot during hunting season in the old days, you know, before cell phones. You know, a woman would call and she'd say, I need you to help me. I need you to stop my husband when he crosses the bridge. I say, okay, why? What's going on? Well, he's going hunting in the UP, and I just noticed in the closet I found his deer rifle. <laughs> Ooh. What's going on here? This lady is afraid to drive across the bridge. So the bridge guy drove her car. He was followed by his buddy in the patrol car. He's uh, now arrived in Mackinac City, and he's getting out, and he's going to go with his uh, pal back to St. Ignace. She's going to come around, get in the driver's seat, and away she goes. She's, she's afraid. There's no charge. You've got to pay the toll, but you don't have to pay extra to have somebody drive your car, your motorcycle, your motorhome, a semi, a passenger bus, you name it, they've got people that can drive it. We get about 1,300 requests a year. So it's several per day. It's not unusual at all. If you're afraid, just let them know. All you have to do is get under the dashboard and close your eyes. <laughs> Sometimes we get oversized loads or half of a house or any more you see these big blades from one of the windmills one of the wind turbines you know those got to go slow and so they'll escort them across at 20 miles an hour and make sure that they're safe um, we sometimes get uh, uh, tankers that are carrying things they're placarded loads the placard is going to tell whether uh, they're carrying something that's flammable or explosive or corrosive or whatever if they know what's in there they log that, and then if there is a problem, if there ever was, they would know how to handle it because they already know what they're dealing with, you know. One time we had a tanker like that come across, and he said that a woman cut him off right at mid-span. I think what happened was she probably didn't like driving on the graded lane, and so as soon as she saw a chance, she cut over, and it was probably too close, but the truck driver turned his wheel real hard because he didn't want to hit her, and his wheels jumped up over the curb uh, on the side, the curb rail there, and the tanker slammed on the brakes, and, and he landed up on the rail, and he was teetering on the rail with that tanker, you know. So he was screaming, and they brought out a, a crane. They were going to get a crane company to come out and help him and pull the thing back. And uh, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Anyway, somebody was under the truck, and they, they said, hey, buddy, what are you carrying in the tank? He said, milk. They started turning the valves. And they opened them up, and all that milk came out, and they emptied the tank. And it all went on the road, and it went down into the straits. We had white beaches for two days. <laughs> and when the load was released, that tank just dropped right back over, and he was on all 18 wheels again. And they said, you know, can you start it? He said, I don't know if it'll start or not. Let's try it. He started up. He got the engine running. He said, let me pull ahead a few feet and try. And he, he jiggy jogged it ahead a little. He said, I think I'm okay, guys. They sent the crane home, and away he went. I don't know what he told him when he got to Escanaba, but he didn't have any milk in there anymore. <laughs> Captain John Lapo later became a colonel in the United States Air Force. But as a captain, he was from Muskegon, and he was flying the Great Circle Route from London, England, to Columbus, Ohio, came across the Great Lakes, came across Canada, said to his crew, you guys seen that new bridge? This was in 1959. No. He said, let's get down below the clouds. I'll show it to you. We got a new they got a new bridge up here in Michigan. Wow. That's the Mackinac Bridge. Yeah. Wow. That's something, Captain. Yeah. Captain, we can see it. Yeah. Real good. Lower and lower. Finally, this young navigator on board said, sir, I cannot authorize this mission. You're getting too close to the bridge. He said, you know, he said, I checked it out. He said, there's 190 feet of clearance from the underside of the bridge in the water. We need 150. I think we can get under there. He went under the Mackinac Bridge, flying a six-engine B-47E bomber. And peeled off and went to Columbus, Ohio, and landed the plane and probably figured that was the end of it. 
That young navigator was telling the story at dinner that night to his parents. His dad was an Air Force general. <laughs> Captain Lapo got his wings clipped. He got court-martialed, never flew again, stayed in the Air Force, stayed true to his country, and served directing a ground service support unit in Vietnam. I thought, what a guy. I want to meet this guy. When I was writing the book, I, was th I tried to find him. I was three years too late. He'd already died. Found his obituary, though. It said, Colonel John Lapo passed away on this date. He is survived by. He was preceded in death by. He is probably best known for flying a bomber under the Mackinac Bridge. <laughs> it was right there, you know. And it said that he was often asked if he had any regrets in his life. And he always answered, only one. I wish I'd flown under the Golden Gate, too. <laughs> Evidently, he was pretty, pretty uh, ornery, this guy, you know. Hey, Queen Elizabeth came to North America in the late 50s, and uh, the Royal Yacht Britannia came under the Mackinac Bridge. We had a terrible shipping accident in 1965 when the Norwegian vessel, the Top Dialsford, smashed into a limestone carrier called the Cedarville, east of the bridge. And the Cedarville turned over and sank and killed 10 sailors. We had a Greek vessel called the Castalia that hit the bridge in 1961. It was uh, in the fog, got on the wrong side of a buoy, hit the North Tower, did about uh, $45,000 worth of cosmetic damage to the bridge, easily repaired. The ship didn't do as well. Had to tow it back to Chicago for repairs. Sometimes you get so much fog in the spring, the water's still cold, but the air warms up, and you don't even see a bridge. You don't even know what's out there. No fog on the shore, but in the straits, just, just clouds. Sometimes you just see the tips of the towers. In the early 70s, we had a, a light airplane with three people on board coming through, probably thought they were higher than they were. And we think that at the last second, they probably saw the side stay cables right in front of them in the fog, because it was evident from the marks that they had turned and tried to get in between the cables and tried to get over. And they didn't. And they clipped the wings off. The fuselage cleared the second side, but the plane spun out of control. All three were killed. Pier 17, weird place. Very first pier put in the lake the first year of construction. The crane man showed up and said, I'm not doing this job. And they said, why? He said, it's too dangerous. This is, this is not good. Well, that crane was going to build the pier up. And he didn't want any part of it. And he walked off the job, and nobody could believe it. This picture was taken two weeks later. That crane toppled over in the wind. He was right. That was a very dangerous spot. Pier 17 has been a weird place always, always. It's hollow, those anchorages. Not the towers, but you know the anchorages that are outside them. They're, they're not solid. They're, they're hollow. And you would think that they'd be solid concrete. But that's actually where all the cabling gets anchored is right there. It's all splayed out. And all that pressure is right on that pier. You drive across that pier, and you always feel a little shudder in the wind. It's, it's just a strange, strange place. It's also the only pier that ever moved. The first year, the engineers measured everything. All the piers were in the water. And they said, Pier 17 moved. The one to the north is Pier 22. It didn't move, but 17 did. David Steinman was very upset. He brought in a freighter loaded with stone, and they put a pyramid of stone all the way around that pier coming up at an angle, like if this was the pier, it's just stone coming right up to the sides, you know? And it creates very strange currents. So you see the water, and you see the water looks different going out the other side, and it's because the currents are so weird. You can be out there in your boat, and you drive your boat along, and all of a sudden your boat takes off on you and goes like this. What's wrong with my boat? Nothing. It's, it's, the, it's the currents taking your your stern and twisting it around. They had a swimming event a few weeks ago, and they had to have a boat stationed east of the bridge at Pier 17 because the swimmers swim straight along the bridge, and all of a sudden they all head for Mackinac Island. <laughs> and it's because of the currents. They don't realize they're doing it, but the current's taking them. They have to get them back on track, you know? Pier 17 is the place where people used to stop, and Pier 22 the same way, and they would try to get out and take their brownie cameras and take movies of the ships, you know. They thought it was a tourist place where people could stop. And they'd say, no, you keep moving, keep moving. Don't stop here. No parking. The signs said no parking until September 11th. Now the signs say that if you stop on the bridge and get out of your vehicle, 
you're going to be charged with a felony. You're going to go to jail because they don't want people stopping on that bridge. That could be a problem. Somebody might be up to something. They had speakers they put out there where they could call from the office if they had a report that was somebody was out of their car. Please move on, you know, like this. Pier 17 is the place where the first of the three babies that were born was born. I covered the one where the baby was born in the car driving across the bridge. And the cops told me that, hey, there was a baby born on the bridge in a car. Called the hospital, you know. We can't tell you anything about HIPAA, you know. We can't tell you anything, you know. Hey, this is a good news story. Come on. We can't tell you anything. We can't even verify that a baby was born. But the police said it was born. Is there anything else you need? You know, we, we, we got work to do here, you know. I couldn't get anything out of them. Then there was a woman who won $60 at the casino in St. Ignace and didn't feel well. And they made her lay down. And then the doctor finally came and looked at her. And she said, I'm pregnant, you know. She said, well, I don't think you're going to have a baby tonight, but I'm going to send you to the hospital in an ambulance. She was going across the bridge, and the baby was born in the ambulance. But the first baby, I heard, was born in an ambulance that stopped on the bridge. I thought, why would they stop? And I called and called and called trying to find people, and nobody could tell me anything about it. Finally, somebody said, did you try this one doctor? I tried the doctor. His nurse said, he, he can't talk to, to you on the phone. You know, he's busy. Kept calling. He doesn't want to talk to you on the phone. Okay. One night I called after hours. He answered the phone. I told him who I was. I said, look, I'm just trying to find out if this did happen. He hung up on me because he's the one that sent that woman to the hospital and told her she was not going to have a baby. And that's, that's what was going on. And she was very premature. Finally, somebody said, call this gal named Kathy. I called this Kathy. And she said, yep, I'm, I was the ambulance attendant. I was on, the, on that crew. I delivered that baby. I said, you did? She said, yes, I did. She said, I was only on ambulance crew for about a year. And I'd only been there for two months. And I was scared to death. I'd never delivered a baby. The ambulance driver, she had never delivered a baby. We called for help. There was an ambulance waiting in Mackinac City that was going to meet us, and they were going to take over. And here we were, coming across the bridge. And she said, that baby was being born right now. And I said, stop, stop. you got to pull over. This baby's being born now. I need help back here. And she said it was pretty, pretty bad. She said the mom was really shook up, and she was upset and flustered. And, and the driver said, I can't stop. There's nowhere to pull off. Oh, wait a minute. I see a place. She pulled over on Pier 17. And I said, what happened then? She said, well, the baby was born. And she said it was just very, very emotional. And everybody was all shook up. And, and uh, she said, I was crying. The mom was all upset. And the driver was crying. And I said, well, what happened? She said, well, I held that little baby. The mom was really premature. I held the baby in my hand. And she said he was purple. And he wasn't breathing. And I just didn't know what to do. And I just rubbed his little back. And all of a sudden, he coughed. And they started to cry. And just then, they were banging on the back doors of the ambulance. And they said, it's the other crew. And they opened up the door. And they said, we'll take the baby. You take the mom. And these people were more experienced. And away they went. And I said, what happened then? She said, I don't know. <laughs> she said, we, we took care of the mom. And we got her to the hospital. But I never found out what happened to the, to the baby. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I said, well, I need, I, I'm writing this book. I want to put this in this book and everything. And she said, well, I know she was from up around Brimley. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a neighbor that lives in the Sioux who I think knows a, a, a woman in Brimley who knows that woman's cousin. <laughs> and I think maybe she might be able to, if we could connect the dots, maybe she could get a hold of her or something. I said, okay, well, that'd be great. I thought this isn't going to happen. I think six weeks went by. I'd just about given up, you know. One day the phone rang. Hey, Mike, are you looking for me? I had a baby on the Mackinac Bridge. I said, yes. I said, tell me your story. She told the same story. So I thought, this is, this is great. This is all true. I said, and is it true you were really premature? She said, yeah. Her tone changed, you know. She said, yeah. She said, that poor little guy. She said, he only weighed two pounds, three and a half ounces. And this would have been 38 years ago now. So, I mean, those things didn't have a good ending back in those days, you know. I said, oh, OK. I said, well, is it OK if I put this in the book? She said, oh, yeah, you can put it in the book. She said, it's kind of my claim to fame that I had a baby on the bridge. I said, OK. I said, well, can I, can I get a picture of you somehow? She said, well, yeah. She said, uh, I come down there all the time. 
do you want to take a picture of me at the bridge? I said, you would do that? She said, yeah, I would do that. I said, well, okay. We set it up for Friday. Just before she hung up, she said, Mike, if you could wait till Monday, I could bring my son along. <laughs> I said, your son survived the birth? She said, oh, yeah, he survived the birth. He's coming home Sunday afternoon from Iraq. <laughs> the guy's a soldier. I thought, this story's getting better and better. <laughs> Monday morning, I was there. Here came this car pulled up. This scrawny little thin gal got out waving at me, walking towards me. Out of the driver's side came this big guy, looked like a fullback, you know. He's walking towards me. I said, Sean, I said, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> I can't believe that somebody as big as you ever weighed two pounds, three and a half ounces on this earth. <laughs> he said, yeah, I know. <laughs> He's a big dude, you know. We had this all set up. You can't just drive out there and take a picture. So the bridge patrol was ready for us. And the bridge guy came over and said, Mike, are you ready? I said, just about. We're waiting on one more. He said, OK, will you say when? And the mom looked at me, and she said, one more? Who else are we waiting for? I said, well, Kathy? She said, Kathy who? I said, well, Kathy, whose friend called the neighbor who knew your cousin who called you. And she looked at me. I said, Kathy, the ambulance attendant that delivered Sean. She said, oh, she's going to be here? I said, well, yeah, I thought she could be in the picture too. Is that OK? She said, oh, I don't know, Mike. I said some awful things to her that day. <laughs> Everybody got along just fine. OK, we're down to the end of the program here. Um, five men died building this bridge. They projected 12. They thought there'd be 12 losses in a project of this size. But quickly, here are the five stories. The first was a hard hat diver. He was diving at the base of the south tower. Came up too fast. They think he was climbing the line. And he got decompression sickness. He died from the bends. The second was a welder. He was inside the caisson of the north tower. He fell. He hit several cross pieces that had been welded on his way down. They were doing cement work at the bottom, very gradually building up the cement layer a little bit at a time. That's where he landed. They got him out of there right away. But I still get people that say, how come you didn't tell the story about the guy that's buried in the bridge? There's nobody buried in the bridge. They're talking about this guy, and his body w was recovered. The third was a, uh, a laborer who was walking from his boat to his pier uh, stationed towards Mackinac City. There were a lot of people on the boat, and they were walking on a 14-inch beam, and it was only four feet above the water. And it was a windy day. It was wet, sloppy, blowing hard. And all these guys are in line going across this beam, and all of a sudden there's one in the water. And they said, somebody hit the water, and they yelled, man overboard. And everybody was watching for him to come up, and watching for him to come up. And all of a sudden they said, there he is, and he was way over here already. The current had taken him that fast, and he was over here. These guys wore steel-toed boots. Uh, you know, they had tool belts, uh, heavy car hearts. I mean, nothing that you'd ever want to try and swim in. And he raised his arm and went below the waves and was not not around. Nobody could get him. When they did recover his body, they found that he had a heart attack. Did he have the heart attack and fall in, or did he fall in and then have the heart attack? That's what we don't know. Uh, those three deaths occurred within a span of 40 days the first year of construction. So morale was not good among the bridge workers. They thought this was really going to be a dangerous project. The last two died the next year. All the piers were in place. The towers were up. No superstructure yet. So when you look at the bridge, nothing that was, is green was up yet, none of the metal. Well, they brought in a company that put in guide cables. The guide cables were only going to serve to support chain link fence that was going to be laid out across the guide cables so that when the real cables were spun, they'd have a place to stand. And this gives you an idea of how the chain link fence would work, and it's not even drawn taut yet, and these guys are actually walking on the cables. But this picture was taken well after the accident, because it's very far down the slope. But they were just getting started. Big roll, huge roll of chain link fence, brought up by a crane, top of the north tower. And they started to peel it off a little bit at a time, like you'd peel off tissue paper off of a roll. 
And as they did that and were starting to fasten it, the spindle in the middle of the, of the bale was attached to the tower, and the line that was holding it snapped. And the roll rolled forward, rolled two men into it, and fell from over 500 feet up. They didn't have a chance. Worst part is those two guys were specialists at what they did. They were there in their first day on the job at the Mackinac Bridge, and they were killed. There's a, uh, a plaque and a statue to honor the memory of the men who died now in uh, Mackinac City and in St. Ignace. Have you walked the bridge? Yeah. Good. We had 30,000 yesterday. Uh, numbers are back up a little bit. It was 25 or 24 last year. The year before that, it was about 19, which is the lowest in a long, long time. And I'll tell you why. The very first year, they had a crowd about like what we've got in this room. It wasn't too many people. <laughs> You're more used to seeing something like this. And, uh, of course, in the last three years, you know, they've realized that we now live in a world where people will drive vehicles into crowds of people to kill. And they did not want that to happen on the bridge because if somebody drove a vehicle into a crowd like that, let alone the people that would be hit, but think of the people who would be knocked off the bridge, they just can't do that. Department of Homeland Security came and said, you guys are looking at a disaster here, waiting to happen. You know, you can't say it's not going to happen in, in St. Ignace because it's happening all over the world. All right. Well, they banned all traffic except for the school buses. The school buses, they ran 120 of them a year, and they take you one direction, Mackinac City to St. Ignace. Then you walk back. It works no matter which direction you come from. You go across on the bus, you walk back. You walk over, you take the bus back, either way. Well, all the signs the state police put up about telling people not to come to Mackinac because the bridge was closed, unless they were walking the bridge until afternoon, people didn't care. They drove on to Mackinac City anyway, and the traffic jam was monumental, and there were thousands of people who wanted to walk the bridge who never got there, never got to Mackinac City. Some of the bus drivers, the bus drivers had to be vetted. Department of Homeland Security had to vet them. What happens the first day of school? There's always subs. Some of the people that didn't come that day were replaced by subs. The subs weren't vetted. They wouldn't let them drive. The buses couldn't run. It was, it was a disaster. So last year, they said, that's it. No more buses, no more vehicles. All you can do is walk. Wow, did that change everything. They loved it. People got there. They did it. It was great. No fumes from vehicles on the, on the bridge. Clean air. You can see everything. They had a great time. And now you can walk it in different ways. You can walk from either direction. You can go halfway and come back. You can walk all the way across and come back if you meet the time constraints. Uh, you can walk from St. Ignace. You can walk from Mackinac City. This year, it was bigger than it had been. So I think it's catching on. It's safe, it's free, and everybody's having a ball. So that worked out really, really well. I think they've got it fixed now. I really do. Biggest crowd ever, 1992. I was there when the first President Bush walked the bridge. 74,000 people walked that year. Normally, we were getting around 50 or 60,000. We've got a ways to go to get it back up to those type of numbers. One year, some people said, hey, we've got a square dance group. Can we square dance across the bridge? And they let them. <laughs> the running races are gone now. The only time they let them run is before the bridge walk. Uh, my daughter and her husband came from Minnesota. They, they, they participated in a lottery, and they got drawn, so they got to do that. That was a fun thing. But uh, used to have a fall and a spring run, no more. I mean... Even if traffic's just normal traffic, what if somebody's distracted and they're messing around on their phone or something? They could hit somebody like that. Same way with the bicycle riders. That used to be a great time. They can't do that now because somebody could hit them just accidentally. It's just too much of a risk. But we still have the Corvette Crossroads. Uh, this weekend, we've got the antique tractors coming, 1,900 of them last year. We've had the uh, Mini Coopers. We've had the Jeeps. We had the, uh, the, the four-wheelers, you know, the, uh, the off-road vehicles. They, they come across. We have the antique autos. We have the uh, truck show in the fall. And that's all a big deal. And so the last thing now that I want to talk about is what you've been waiting to hear about. And I have a whole chapter about the saddest day in the history of the Mackinac Bridge. Leslie Ann Pluhar from Royal Oak, not far from here lost her life on the bridge in an accident, a traffic accident. 
People say, are you going to tell the story about the car that blew off the bridge? We don't really think that's what happened. What we think happened is she had a traffic accident on the bridge. And there's three ways to look at the story, and I tell all three ways in a whole chapter in the book about this incident. From the family standpoint, from the bridge's standpoint, and from the state police standpoint, and they all are slightly different. The skid marks showed that she was going between 64 and 67 miles an hour. The speed limit's 45. She was driving a very lightweight car called a Yugo that they don't even make anymore, and she passed a semi. What happens on the interstate when you drive a normal car past a semi? You feel that. Well, that little car shuddered, and what we think happened was she probably straddled the median strip. The median strip is four inches high and 24 inches wide. They put that in to stop people like my grandpa from doing U-turns, you know? <laughs> And we think that that car got on the wrong side of that median strip. And unlike the rumble strips that we now hear on the road where you just touch the wheel and you're, you're back off that rumble strip. Well, she couldn't get the small wheelbase on the Yugo back over the median strip. And so after trying, she probably saw oncoming traffic. So she turned it hard. And at that speed, she flipped the car. And when she rolled the car, she had a rollover accident. She hit the side stay cables. It hit right across the back of the top of the, the car, and she spun around, and she fell 170 feet into the water, and she entered the water, they think, from the marks on the car, upside down and backwards. Now, if you can imagine a more horrific way to die, it's, it's hard to. Um, the sad part is the autopsy showed that she drowned. So she was alive when she hit the water. The state police did a great job of recovering her. She was, uh, you, knew it was you knew there was going to be a lawsuit, and there was, and I've got all the details of that in the chapter too. Um, the family had to wait two weeks for them to get the car off the bottom and to get it back. And everything had to be preserved just as it was, you know. But... Uh, I've got pictures from the state police divers that have never been published in the book. This is the only one I show at the talks like this because she's actually in the vehicle here, but you can't see her. And so I show this photograph, but uh, that's what a Yugo looks like after it's hit the water and gone 153 feet to the bottom. She was right on the edge of a cliff where if, if the current had taken her further, she would have gone 300 feet down. And that would have been really, really tough. The divers risked their lives to, to, to bring her back. And the family was adamant. They did not want any of the divers to be injured. They didn't want anybody to have a problem. They were, they were, it was just awful to watch this family suffer like that, you know. About 10 years later, by the way, the lawsuit was settled out of court. But I've got the details of that in the book. 10 years later, we had a Ford Bronco go off the bridge, uh, we believe on purpose. And um, Richard Daraban was his name. And uh, the difference was that there was ice in the straits. And so that's different when you hit the ice. His body was thrown clear. They recovered him on the ice, but they did go to the bottom to get the car. And they brought it back. And it's hard to even see that this was an automobile. This is actually in a chapter that uh, I titled uh, The Unfortunate Choice. You know what I'm talking about. We haven't had a whole lot of that. We'd had 12 when I wrote the book. I believe we're at 19 right now, and that's in over 60 years. Uh, the Golden Gate has been up since the late 30s, and they are over 1,600. And they're putting a net under their bridge now because people ignore the signs that say, do you need help? Call 1-800, you know, get somebody to help you. I give credit to the Mackinac Bridge workers. They're cutting the grass, they're welding something, they're fixing something in the shop, and they get a call. Hey, there's somebody up on one of the cables. There's somebody standing at the rail. And these guys aren't, and women, aren't trained as psychologists or psychiatrists or, or counselors or mediators, but they go out there and they have saved lives. They've talked a lot of people down, talked them back and save their lives. So I, I think they deserve a lot of credit uh, for doing the work that they do. Now we have a system underneath the bridge that moves the workers real fast from one place to another. So they don't have to climb up on the bridge to walk to get from point A to point B. They can go under the bridge. 
And that's good because they can see if there's anything under the bridge. If somebody's been messing around under there, they can tell, you know, which is a good thing for our safety. Now we've got cameras everywhere. The cameras are at the water. They're at the base of the towers. They're at the top of the towers. They're at the road deck. They're at the different stations along the road. They're at the exits. They're at the, uh, the rest areas. They're everywhere around the bridge, at the toll booths. If you're anywhere near that bridge, you're on camera. And that's for a reason. Uh, that was bought with money from a grant after 2000, after September 11th. I wouldn't joke about terrorism, and that's what it's about. But you know the funny thing? You know what they see on the cameras more than anything else? When people run out of gas. And it happens an average of once a day. 360 people ran out of gas last year on the Mackinac Bridge. I don't know if they think the gas is cheaper in St. Ignace or Mackinac City, but <laughs> they go for it and they, they run out, you know. This is the view out my dining room window. I never get tired of it. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime or daytime, winter or summer. Uh, stormy, calm, nice. I, I never get tired of looking at that bridge. I just think it's so wonderful. You know, it stands for Michigan. It makes me so proud to live in Michigan, where this is our icon. This is what we're about, is this beautiful bridge that's connected our Straits of Mackinac. And uh, I think you're probably as proud of it as I am. You know? My name is Mike Forens. I wrote a book about how the Mackinac Bridge was built. And uh, the subject of my talk tonight was all the things that have happened on the bridge since it's been up. If you come to Mackinac, uh, visit any of the stores. They've all got the, the, the books in the stores. Uh, they're $30 books. Uh, when I come to events like this, I discount them to $20. So uh, if you'd like one signed, I'd be happy to do that. I'm uh, ready with uh, change. I can take checks, and I can do credit cards, too. Okay. <laughs> what a wonderful audience you were. It was so fun to come and talk to you. Thanks for having me. Okay.